Well, open with me to John chapter 19. We will spend a little time in John 19 today, but I'm going to open the service a little bit differently here, the sermon time. I want to talk a little bit about the events of last night, not so much that I'm you know, trying to be political or talk about political stuff that isn't what the pulpit time is for. But we do have a problem in our country. We, ha we have issues that need to be worked through. They need to be resolved. Um, they're the same issues that the world has always had, to be frank with you. Um, the problem of sin, the problem of evil, that hasn't changed. That's always been there since the fall. But when our politics go to the level of where we're now starting to take action and harmful action against one another, this is where we run into severe problems. And as Christians, I hope we know that this is not the right way to respond to our political differences. No matter how angry you are, no matter how much you think evil is taking over, uh, violence and anger and aggression, this is never the answer. And yeah, this time, you know, our political party was attacked. And I say ours because I, I think I know how at least most of you would vote. <laughs> but the problem isn't whether you stand on the left or the right. Those are issues that we need to work through. But the real problem is the problem of sin. The real problem is the problem of evil. But more importantly, as I've titled the sermon, and it fits perfectly in with the text we're going to talk about this morning, God loves even through suffering. And we have been commanded to love even through suffering, even through anger, even through hardship, even through difficulty, and even through physical attack. I want you to think about some things as we talk this morning. I mean, obviously, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the attempt to assassinate former President Donald Trump last night. I hope you already already knew that, but if you didn't, I'll tell you what I'm going on and on about. Obviously, it's a despicable act, completely reprehensible, a very attempt to take out a president of any sort, former or current, is despicable on every level. There's nothing righteous or justifiable in the act. I don't care what your politics are. If your heart is that dark where you think taking out your political opponent with a gun is appropriate, and if any of you have cheered, and I'm certain most of us have not, but even if the other side, even if they're cheering, it's wrong, it's evil. Imagine where your heart is as you could watch someone have a bullet graze their ear. Maybe take off part of the ear, I don't know, we haven't heard officially all of the details, but it definitely struck his ear, centimeters from his skull, a bullet. You saw the images. To think that anyone in America would be okay with this. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable that people would be okay with such things. And I'm not here to talk to the American people. Obviously, that's not my position. I'm not the president, but I am a pastor of a church and we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. And I mean all of us, the American people, but the church. Because I sometimes hear from our own mouths the kind of political rhetoric which leads to this kind of bloodshed. And let's not forget, someone died last night. The shooter, certainly, he got the justice immediately. When he pulled those shots off, the Secret Service, we saw the video. They shot him dead. But he also, with his gunfire, hit someone and killed them immediately. And there's at least one other person, I think, that's still fighting for their life who may not live. I, I haven't heard if they've passed or not. I think a couple other people may have been injured as well. Political violence has no place, Christian people. You may think that the Revolutionary War gives you a justification to rebel against a government or to fight against tyranny, but you don't understand the history there if you think it's that simple and that it's that easy. 
Very few of the people who picked up arms to fight off the British when they invaded the country wanted that war to happen. They were fighting against friends and family members and brothers and sisters. You need to understand that very few of them wanted that war. There is no political justification, Christian people, for this type of behavior. And to say this is okay on either side of the fence is wrong. Not only to mention it's not biblical. It's not what Jesus did. It's not what he commanded. It's not what any of the Bible instructs you and I to do. I know you are passionate about our country. I know you're passionate about our people, about truth, about faith, about politics. I understand that. I am too. But this is never the answer. Never. And if you, if you can say that your heart has never felt rage and anger and anguish and maybe even despair to the point where you've thought about taking this kind of action, then you probably don't have a heart. Because of course our hearts inside think those things. Remember, we have a flesh. We have an evil, wicked, sin-craving flesh. Even believers who are indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God have a flesh inside. I understand it. I do too. I rage sometimes inside, internally, about stuff like this. Of course, I want to get in the gun safe and go out and take justice into my own hands. But that's horrible. And you'll note, I've never done that. That While that thought enters the mind, it has never entered my heart as something I would do. Or even be willing to, to justify on any level. There are too many people in this country, and this is our whole country, but it also is in the church, speaking and acting like this rhetoric needs to be taken out with action. And now look what happened. It was just recently the President of the United States, President Biden, said in a speech that, they, that a bullseye needs to be put on Donald Trump. You, you ought to just think about that for a minute. Your president said that a bullseye ought to be painted on the chest of, of his number one rival, but also a former president of the United States. That's heinous at the highest level. That's evil of a mind that you can't even imagine. That would be like you standing up and saying, let's go down here and assassinate the mayor. Put a bullseye on our mayor or our commissioners or whoever. Could you imagine? We can be angry Christians. We can. The Bible says so. We have every right to be angry about things that are unjust and unrighteous and evil. But it says be angry and do not sin. The minute you and I take justice into our hands, or anyone else takes justice into their hands, they've, they've violated the Scripture. Because one, we're commanded not to take justice into our hands, but we're also told that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And there is only one who gets to take vengeance for evil. Now, can we punish crime? Of course. And you saw the execution of justice last night. If you watch the videos, the Secret Service sniper executed justice based on their defense doctrine of a president or former president or the people they're guarding, and they retaliated in kind and neutralized the threat. And I'll put it plainly the man was shot and killed. As the only thing we know, we know his name and we know. He was 20 years old. What kind of rhetoric goes on in a country where a 20-year-old picks up a rifle to kill a president, former or otherwise? Do you remember King David in the Bible? Because King David, he was being attacked by the king of the time, even though David had been declared by the prophet to be the coming king. David was being attacked over and over and sought to kill him, Saul did, Saul the king, with his armies. 
and his soldiers. And David had to hide. He had to run for his life and hide in caves. Well, he was in one cave on a particular day, and Saul the king came into that cave in the darkness. Didn't know David was there. David had every opportunity to assassinate the king who was trying to kill him. Do you remember what David did? He said, there's no way that I'll raise my hand to the anointed of the Lord. And if you remember, in those days, kings were anointed by prophets. He said, I won't kill the king. I would never do such a thing. I'm not God. Why do we think we could do something that even King David would not do? We can't, and we shouldn't. And when these thoughts enter our mind, they need to leave just as quickly. And I'm getting to the greater example, and the sermon will push mostly into the greater example of Christ. But you can hurt, you can grieve for our country, for people. But our words and actions need to follow our Lord's leading. They need to be loving and kind. They need to be compassionate. They need to be true and not based on assumptions. They need to be loving in the face of great suffering. And there's no doubt. Some of you, me included, are suffering. Donald Trump is suffering. Imagine the family who lost their loved one to a shooter that wasn't trying to kill them as far as we know. He was trying to take out former President Trump. But somebody lost their lives in the crossfire. Now, maybe they aim for them. We don't know that. But it seemingly they just were in the middle between here and there. And they got shot. Imagine the family reeling because somebody wanted to take out their political adversary. The Lord Jesus, He understands and knows suffering better than you and I. He understands it more completely, more fully. And believe me, God has had to handle suffering way more often than any human being. Because He takes all of the mockery, all of the rebellion, all of people's evil, he has to see and take it all. Not only that, the Lord came to the cross, which we have been talking about in great detail. And if you can't see how the demonstration of the cross is an act right in the midst of great suffering, it's an act of love and kindness and compassion and mercy and grace, unlike anything you can imagine if you get the weight of it. He is taking on the sin of the entire world. All those who ever believe their sins are being wiped out on that cross. All of it being assumed by the Lord Jesus. He understands suffering. He's taken all of this rebellion since the beginning of the creation from the time of the fall. And He has demonstrated His love very clearly, by not destroying every single one of, us in the, one of us in the moment of our sin. Is that true? Instead, He came compassionately to die for and pay for the sin of those who have hurt Him, who have attacked Him, yea, those who have killed Him. It's in this time of deep anger and grief and fear that the love of God should be most clear from God's people. I, I know you hate evil. I know you despise it. And I'm not saying you should never speak out against it. Of course, we preach from the Bible every single day. We preach the truth. But we don't take guns to people's homes and put them to their heads and say, believe this or die. And you'll notice Jesus didn't operate that way either. He does promise eternal judgment if you never believe, but he gives you your entire life an opportunity to believe the truth. Imagine, your judgment doesn't come until after you die. He doesn't make death the thing that's going to cause your judgment. Your judgment's already set, but it's after you die. Why in the world can't Christian people love enough to see that the people doing these things, they need Christ? That 20-year-old, he'll never have an opportunity now. 
Whatever he was when he died, and I don't know a thing about the man. I don't know if he claimed Christianity. I don't know if he believed. I don't know if he's an unbeliever. I don't know if he worships Satan. I have no idea. But he will never have an opportunity to do anything else now. Because as of last night, he entered into eternity, whatever that was. And can you imagine, if you take the same actions or similar actions, or you allow yourself to be so built up with hatred and fear and anger, that if you would accidentally, even in your frustration, strike out and kill someone, you've erased their opportunity to do anything else. Do you want that on your conscience? Do you want to kill an unbeliever in their evil just because you can? True meekness is having the power, but not taking action on something like that. If you're going to be meek, you're going to realize that this person is a human being. Even if they're demon-possessed, they're a human being who needs to have that demon cast out. They need to have Jesus enter their life and the Holy Spirit indwell them. They need that as much as you do. The President of the United States, Mr. Biden, he needs Christ. Praying for him would be the thing to do. Maybe write him a letter. I don't know if he'll get it or not. But maybe write him a letter and tell him how much he needs to trust Christ, the Christ of the Bible. It was a terrible act. But it's also an opportunity for the church to start to reflect. And let's be very clear. You're going to make a decision to either walk the way Jesus walked or you're going to make a decision to do what you want. And if you do what you want, more evil is going to come into this world. And some of it's going to be at your hands. But if, you'll, if you will just establish yourself, stabilize yourself on the Word of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Christ, and walk the way Christ asked you to walk, you are going to look very different from the society we're about to see in the next few weeks, days and weeks. You're going to see chaos. You're going to see anger and rage and maybe more violence. But Christian people, I hope we aren't named in any of those incidents. I hope all people see from us is the love of Jesus. The truth of the gospel being preached, the truth of God's judgment that's coming, but in love with the idea and the thought and the hope that they will be saved. I I would like to take this time not to just pray myself. I know that's what I normally do, open the sermon. But I actually want to ask all of you, if you're willing, come up here. Let's pray around the, the stage area. You can call it an altar if you want. It's not a temple, but... You can pray up here. I would like that. If you can't come up here, I understand. And if you can't kneel down, I'm, I understand. Um, you're welcome to just turn around in your seat if you don't want to come up here. But I want to ask a, a whole bunch of us, hopefully, to come up here. Let's pray. We haven't done this a lot, but we need to do this, and we need to do it well. We have a country in peril. We have a country on the verge of great violence. Imagine if something like this spurs off and strikes off another civil war in America. Could you imagine millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people dying just because of something like this? We need to pray. I'm not saying that's coming. I'm saying that I've heard people say those words. In recent months, the level of the temperature of political Pain and anger and anguish and sometimes, like I said, despair is so high. You can see it. People are ready to take their guns up and start to fight over ideologies. Not because anyone did anything to this young man, particularly probably. Again, I don't know him. But because of an ideology and a demonization of another person. And if you're guilty of demonizing the other side, stop it. Be serious and honest about what they've done, but don't say, 
we need to kill him, or he needs to die, or God needs to strike him with light. Don't say this kind of stuff. Let's come up here and pray.
I forgot I turned my mic off. People on the stream will think we're praying silently, even though it sounds like it's out loud in here. <laughs> well, I'll keep the rest of this sermon fairly short. We're going to take just a small bit of text. Back in your Bibles in chapter 19 in John, start with me in 25, we're going to read down through 30. It says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom, Je- whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And so we have this text, and so you'll notice standing there close to the cross, and as you go through the Gospels, you'll see different angles on this. Sometimes these ladies are far away, and sometimes they're close. Uh, In John specifically, they're close because there there are words exchanged, so they have to be close enough to actually speak with Jesus, and he speak with them. But in some of the Gospels, they're far away, and so I want you to picture a scene where initially as they go to the cross, these women probably stayed back for a couple good reasons. One, the soldiers are getting him on the cross. There's probably a pretty decent soldier presence there to get these people on the crosses and then make sure the crowd isn't going to try to free them. Or Just imagine what the Roman soldiers had to deal with regularly with people who were being crucified, families and friends and maybe groups of people trying to save these people and get them down and rescue them. So the chaos initially as they go to the cross is going to be quite a lot. And I'm sure there's quite a good soldier presence there keeping the people at bay. Stay back. Let us do our work. Whatever. And so they're probably standing a ways back. Now it just says afar off, so we don't know. Does that mean 20 feet? Does that mean 100 yards? We don't know. But they're not right up against the cross initially according to the other Gospels. But there comes a time in this, and you can see with the words that are spoken here, it's very near the end of Jesus' life. And if you'll recall the timing, at least from Mark's gospel, it's very clear. It's a six-hour ordeal. He goes on the cross at the third hour, which is about 9 a.m. Third hour of a day, daily watch is 9 a.m. He's, the sun goes out. Darkness comes on the land three hours later at noon. And then it stays dark until 3 p.m. in the afternoon, which is where he speaks those final words and and gives up his spirit. And so, this is a long ordeal. It's about six hours. Now, it's not as long as a normal crucifixion, which could take days. But remember, Jesus is beaten really well already. He's been through several beatings and uh, mockeries and back torn open and who knows. But remember, no one is killing Jesus anyway. You can have that viewpoint, the Romans are doing it, the Jews are doing it, even like I said before, you're responsible. You can have that viewpoint, and it's biblical. Those are all right, but there's a bigger picture. God is killing His Son, God the Father, and the Son is giving up His life willingly. And again, I'm going to read that passage to you in a few minutes. We've read it in John 10 previously. But there is a mystery as you see these ladies standing there. If you'll notice here... In John, there are four, and again, some people read this differently, so there's up to four women standing here. There could be three, and some people even boil this down and try to say it's just two women, and the other things are like titles or whatever. But there's a bit of a mystery with these women here. From the information that we have in the gospel accounts, if you take all of the accounts where they talk about this, and I'm going to read you Matthew and Mark here in a minute, it may actually be that John the Apostle, I, I never knew this, by the way, until just looking into this for this sermon, but it may be that John the Apostle is potentially Jesus' cousin. I don't know if you knew that or not. But you'll notice um, Mary's sister, depending on how you read this, is standing at the cross with Mary. And let me, let me read you the other two passages, because you heard what it said here. 
But let's read Matthew 27, 55 through 56. It says, And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So she's unnamed, but she's called the mother of Zebedee's sons, which are James and John, if you recall. Okay? Now, there, there are three mentioned there, right? Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Mary the mother of Zebedee's sons. So Jesus' mom is not mentioned there, but the other three are. But notice there's no name. Look in Mark 15 now in verse 40 and 41. It says, there were also women looking on from afar. And you notice in both of those Gospels, they're looking on from a distance in, in this place. Among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less and Joseph, and Salome, or you might call her Salome, but Salome is how you pronounce her name, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And, and so we get the name that time in Mark, which is interesting. So apparently James and John had a mother named Salome. Now, if you look back here in, in the John passage, did you catch it? Look in 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, which is not named over there, his mother's sister, unnamed, but Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So the Mary Magdalene carries, we can catch that one. The, the wife of Clopas, we don't know much about Clopas, but there's a little bit in the Bible. But you notice that also, read the way it is parsed in John anyway, and his mother's sister. So there's a very good possibility that his mother's sister is Salome. It's the same woman who's given in the other two lists, but not named in one of them. Named in Mark, not named here. But you notice John doesn't name himself. So it kind of makes sense he may not name his mother. But it is, there is a real possibility here that, that Mary's sister is Salome, the mother of James and John, so that James and John turn out to be cousins. Let me, let me give you a couple of, or, or sorry, James and John end up being the cousins of Jesus. Let me read you just a couple of points on this subject matter. Um, one named woman witnessing the crucifixion from a distance was Salome. That's from Mark 15:40. In the parallel passage, Matthew 27, 55 says that an unnamed woman was watching the crucifixion from a distance. She's unnamed, and I, I think I told you that already. Second point, note the position of Salome and the unnamed woman within the verses in Matthew and Mark. She is listed right after another Mary who was the mother of James the Younger and Joseph. That's certainly not James and John's mother. It's two different people. So just imagine... It's, once you start to parse this all out, it becomes much more clear. Today, I just have some notes here. Today, no one knows who these three were, but I wonder whether she was the wife of Clopas in John 19.26. But maybe not because of James, Jacob the Younger. His father may have had the same name. We'll never know for sure, will we, <laughs> at this point? Back to the main point, the natural inference is that the unnamed woman in Matthew's gospel is Salome. Same, same thing we've been thinking about here. But then in John 19, 25, it says that a few of the women moved closer to the cross. An, un, an unnamed woman was the sister of Mary, Jesus' mother. And that's the way John, 25, John 19, 25 says it here. If the beloved disciple was John, and again, I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. We've already talked about that way back before, but if the, if, the unna, if the beloved disciple is John, and likely was, then this explains why Jesus handed his mother to him. One, Jesus loved him, he trusted him, we talked about all that before. As they witnessed up close the gruesome death of Jesus, um, it also explains why John is standing there at the cross with Mary and his mother. He's comforting them. Imagine they're back, they're witnessing this. Jesus is very close to death now. And they come closer. They come closer and they're right there in front of him as he's about to die. Imagine they would want support of their son. There's no question. Or their nephew or, you know, whoever was available. Um, further, if the unnamed woman was Salome, the wife of Zebedee, this would explain in part why Jesus chose Capernaum as his adopted hometown and ministry base in northern Galilee. Zebedee and his two sons, James and John, had the fishing business there. And so he was there with family. 
right there in Capernaum. That all makes perfect sense. It tracks. Sure, you can say it's, a, it's an inference, but it's an inference based on the text. That is, it seems, and again, I'm not try, trying to say that I'm hanging my hat on this and that I know every detail here, but it sure seems like Salome is Mary's sister and that, you know, Jesus and John were cousins. And so that's pretty interesting, especially in light of there was another John who Jesus was a cousin of, John the Baptist. But you'll notice that Jesus doesn't talk about that relationship at all. How well he knew John seems like he didn't know him at all because John had to have him pointed out to him when he was ministering. So it's almost like John didn't even know. But it also mentions here the disciple whom Jesus loved, which we've determined before. This is John, the apostle himself. He never names himself in his gospel. He's completely unnamed as he's writing it. He'll say, you know, that man or the one that Jesus loved or the beloved disciple or something. John 13, 23 through 25 says this. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples. And if you remember, this is way back at the beginning of our talk about the night of that Passover meal, right? This is during that Passover meal. John apparently is reclining on Jesus' breast at the table. Remember, they laid on their side on pillows around a low table all the way around the table to eat dinner. They didn't do it like we do sitting in chairs and that kind of thing. They reclined beside one another. And in this case, John is actually leaning on the breast of Jesus. And so anyway, it says, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. And it says, then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And John's talking about himself, obviously, in the third person here. Um, But then Jesus goes on and he says, woman, behold your son. Um, Jesus is looking down at John, and he's looking down at Mary, his mother, and he says, woman, behold your son, son, or John, behold your mother. This is, this is super important because it goes right along with everything that we're talking about this morning. I want you to look at what's happening. This isn't just a normal conversation with the Lord. The Lord is hanging on a cross, literally minutes probably from dying from the time he gives up his spirit. He's hanging there. And he has not only the wherewithal, but the love and the compassion to look down on his aged mother at this point. You know, and we don't know exactly how old she was, but, you know, let's, let's assume she's around 50 or something. I mean, you know, she's getting older at this point. She might have been 55. Who knows? She's probably in that ballpark. But he looks down at her, and he says mother your son. Since he's the oldest, if his father's gone, Joseph, the human father, if he's gone, then somebody needs to take care of Mary, because that was his responsibility to care for Mary, since he was the oldest son. This is Jewish law, Jewish custom. And so he looks down and he says, woman, do you refer to your mom as woman, men? I don't recommend it. You probably get a backhand of knuckles, and that's even if you're still 50 or something. If I called my mom a woman, she gets all worked up. Boy, don't call me a woman. But he says, woman, behold your son. And and he tells basically John, look, you are now responsible for caring for my mother. Now, Jesus trusts him. Jesus, you know, obviously they both love Jesus. They're both followers of Jesus at this point. Notice Jesus' own mother is a follower of her son. She trusts Christ. She's a believer. And so is John, his, potentially his cousin. I think his cousin. But Jesus is, is right in the midst of dying. He takes care of her and he pours out love and compassion. This is not a God who is indifferent to our suffering. He certainly wasn't indifferent to his own suffering. But notice, even in the midst of the very act of dying, he offers compassion, love, and direction. What can we do in our suffering? If our Lord can do that through the Holy Spirit, what could we do if we turn our suffering around and stop looking so much at us and what it's costing us to go through an event? our loss, our grief, our hurt. 
What could we do if we just turned that around the way Jesus did? And look at the results of what that suffering is going to bring. Of course, salvation to every single human being who will trust Christ. That's first and foremost. But that suffering is going to cause his mom a great deal of grief. But Jesus doesn't forget her in the moments there. He says, John, and you know, I'm paraphrasing obviously, take care of my mother. Take care of your aunt, if so be he is her nephew. Take care of her. Love her. Care for her. And you know what we have in, in church history and tradition? Many people writing about this in the early centuries is that John took Mary with him when the Roman persecution got really hot and heavy in Israel leading up to the stuff that happens in AD 70. At some one of those intervening years, just ahead of AD 70, they left Israel. It must have been in the early or mid 60s uh, because that's apparently when Mary dies. But he takes her back to Ephesus. And some of them even recorded they lived in a small house on the edge of Ephesus. And that's where Mary dies. She dies there in the mid-60s is what they think. They don't know for sure the exact date. But somewhere in the mid-60s, A.D., she dies. And, of course, John, he lives well into old age. Now, remember, he's probably 20 years younger than she is or something, or maybe more, 25. Remember, he's a young man compared even to Jesus. So when he, he may have been in his early 20s or something while Jesus is in his 30s. So he could be... You know, he could be considerably younger than Mary, but he lives on into old age. And of course, we know he's exiled to Patmos and he spends all that time on Patmos until at least A.D. 95. You know, there are several years we, we don't like I said, we don't know the exact year he was exiled, but um, that Caesar was put in power in 81 and he died in 95, which is when John was released. So. Somewhere in there, John was exiled to Patmos, but he gets out, goes back to Ephesus, continues to preach, and Polycarp and others left records saying that he would preach, they would put him on a board and lean him against a board, and he would stand up and preach to the people into, well into his old age, because he couldn't stand in front of them anymore to teach or sit in front of them. He, they had to lean him on a board, almost like he's laying down in a bed, and prop him up so he could teach them the Bible. <laughs> could you... I, if a man like that were still alive who walked with Jesus for three years, I would want to talk to him too. I would want to go hear him and question him and ask every single question. What is Jesus like? What did he say? What's the specific thing he said about this situation that's not in the Bible? <laughs> Wouldn't you? I would talk their ear off. They probably would hate me because I would be asking so many questions. But Jesus didn't say what, why that happened. I want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. That used to be an ad. Do you remember that? Inquiring minds want to know. I want to know. <laughs> anyway, so you see this, which is really important, and the text records here from that hour that disciple took her to his own home, and it's, it's true. As far as we can tell historically, traditionally, he, he did exactly as the Bible says here. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished and that the Scripture might be fulfilled, the first thing he says, which I found interesting here, is, I thirst. <laughs> So it records all the things are fulfilled, which what he's talking about is Jesus, remember, he was fulfilling the law and the prophets perfectly. He lived out the exact things that the Bible had predicted he would. Now, he wasn't walking through life saying, well, I need to fulfill that and I need to... He was performing exactly what they had already predicted that God had predicted that would happen with Jesus. And I, I told you last week, there's at least 330 I hope you guys looked it up, because I looked it up again just to make sure I was right. And in the known universe, the number of atoms is 10, they believe, and there's a range between 10 to the 82nd or 10 to the 87th. So 10 with that many zeros following. And I told you it's less than 10 to the 100, which is what the, the probability of one man fulfilling 330 individual unique prophecies in his lifetime from the, from the Old Testament, it's more unprobable than all the atoms in the known universe. Atoms, they're little. 
There are trillions or billions of them in your body. But there aren't even 10 to 100 in the whole universe. You ought to think about the magnitude of what I'm saying. Proving that Jesus is who he said he is. And he fulfilled precisely, according to the scripture, every one of them. The words of the Apostle John right here are saying exactly what Jesus was thinking. And what he will say in just a minute. But the first thing he says is, I thirst. I want you to know that that could be completely arbitrary and you might just forget it's there. But I caution you because I think that's there to tell us he's human. He's a real human being is dying. Not some automaton or or some model of a human, not some, not some, you know, puppet. A real human being is on that cross dying. Yes, he's the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. Yes, he's the God, the Creator. He's all the things we know. But he's also a human. He took on human form. And on that cross, right at the end of his life, one of the things he says to them is, I thirst. That tells you everything you need to know. That's a real man suffering a real death. And could you imagine being on that cross? No food, no water. After the brutal beatings you've taken, the parching of the sun, even though it's been dark for three hours at this point, but all of the brutality of the elements and the weather, exposure, I thirst. I think it's amazing. Because it goes along with everything else the Bible tells us. That Jesus earned the right to become the high priest. He earned the right to be the mediator of the covenant. And here you get to see his humanity shining through such great suffering. His humanity is still there even though he's about to die. He's about to give up his life. But this isn't some unfeeling, ethereal, faraway God. This is the very one who came down and became one of us to die and to conquer all the things we could not defeat, he did. I hope you see the beauty of the things that are recorded in this text. Remember, John's whole goal with his gospel is to teach us that Jesus is the Son of God and in believing we'll have life in his name. That's his whole goal. And yet he records these very human statements. This is what Jesus said in his last few minutes. But he also says something else. And it's recorded in the Greek. I have no idea what language he said it in. I'm just going to go with the Greek because that's what it's written in. It says, tetelestai. Or you can read it in the English translated there. It is finished. But he says tetelestai, which means it's fully complete. And what he's declaring with those words, is absolutely every single thing that he was to fulfill and was predicted, prophesied to fulfill, every last bit of it had been completed. Not only that, the full plan of redemption to save humanity is right on the verge of completion, and the only step left is for him to die. Once he dies, the whole thing is secured. Now, I know you'll say in your mind, well, we need him to rise from the dead too. I know, I know. But my point is, it is finished up to that point, to the point of death and him accomplishing the task he was sent to do. There's been no sin. There's been no failure. There's no gaps. You and I have a life filled with faults and gaps and Jesus had none of that. Can you imagine your progress bar of life? And you've all seen a progress bar, right? It fills based on what it's doing all the way up. Our life, if we saw our progress bar, it'd have little gaps in it. Maybe some big gaps. Like the entire beginning of my life. You know, my mom hates it when I do this. The entire beginning of my life would be ungodly. All the way to like the early 20s. Just ungodly would be the way you'd say it. And then my progress bar starts. And even then, it probably has some gaps where I'm serving myself. Jesus's nothing like that. 
Just one green, solid progress bar from beginning to end. No sin, no faults, no holes. To tell us die. It is finished. He's done what he came to do. He's accomplished it. And aren't you glad he did? Are you glad? Are you really glad Jesus accomplished it? <laughs> I would hope I'd get at least one amen. Is that it? Really? One amen. Oh, sure, pastor, whatever. Amen. I'll say it if you want me to. It's just weird. Shouldn't we have resounding amen? Shouldn't we have hallelujah? That means praise Yah, by the way. Hallel, the word for praise. Yah at the end of it, praise Yah. Hallelujah should be something on your lips constantly. Praise Yah, which is the beginning of Yahweh. It's also the beginning of Yahshua. Think about that. You should be praising all the time. And, it, and it's, you're not going to turn to stone if you, amen, a point in a sermon. Thank you. Thank you. See, we need visitors to come and teach you all how to, how to amen. Do you guys amen in your church? or is, it's, it's the same thing. It's kind of, okay. Well, I'm talking to a, I'm beating a dead horse, aren't I? I knew there'd be one in every crowd. But anyway, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus killed Jesus. God the Father killed Jesus. God sent his son to die. You know, God sent his son. They called him Jesus. See, you won't even sing with me. So I have to sing it alone. Oh, wow. Well. But it's a simple message with a simple point. God's love is clearly demonstrated in the suffering of Jesus. One, his love for the world that was lost. For you, his love for you, believer, is demonstrated in his death and suffering on that cross. There's no question. It's clear. But think about Jesus in those moments. Even with the wherewithal, and the strength and the grace and the mercy to pour out his love on his mom, his disciple, and to give his mother's care into the hands of the disciple whom he loved. I really need you to pull this all together in your mind because I'm not sure I can do it. And I hope the Holy Spirit does it. But pull this all together. I want you to remember the picture of Jesus on the cross doing this with his mother and just how amazing the love is in that moment. But I also want you to picture Donald Trump last night getting up off the ground after being shot in the ear, very close to his skull. And what did he do? His first reaction was not to curse and swear at Joe Biden or the shooter or rail. What did he do? Put his hand in the air and he told the country to fight even if you take him out to fight. Now, he's not Jesus. It doesn't carry the magnitude of the cross. I, I'm not trying to compare the two. I'm trying to put two images in your head. Because in that moment, Donald Trump could have just hid. He could have said, get me out of here. He could have said, my skin is the most important. I need to survive, so let's go. He didn't do that. Stood right up there and told the country to keep fighting for freedom, for justice, for whatever. And the Lord Jesus, with the nails pierced through his hands, pierced through his feet, the crown of thorns had been pressed on his head, his back beaten raw. And he's still pushing up and down for six hours to breathe on that cross, grating his already ripped apart back against a wooden cross. Can you picture, are you getting these pictures? And yet it's love, it's mercy, it's graciousness, it's, it's humility that comes across in these expressions. It isn't, it isn't kill everyone. It isn't, I, I want them to die for what they've done to me. I'm so important, I've got to kill them all. It's none of those things. It's the grace and the love and the mercy of our God expressed. And Christian, you can do this. 
you can come through suffering or go through suffering or bear or endure suffering, great suffering even, and you can do it in a gracious way that God has done it, that Christ has done it, with love on your lips and love in your heart, with graciousness and with mercy, and the gospel should be poured out. In your greatest time of need, turn your focus away from you. Because turning it to you is only going to make it worse. You know how we are. Oh, woe is me. I might as well just die. I'll just eat worms. The old saying. Turn it away from you for a moment and say, why did God put His Son into this situation of suffering... What was earned? What did it gain? And you'll see it's the whole world. It's the whole eternity for believing people. But now put yourself in there. What could God be doing through me if I just stop looking at me for a moment? And I'll take my suffering and project that out and allow other people to be my focus. Yes, I'm hurting, but I want to love through this. I want to offer grace through this. I want to show mercy. I want to show the gospel and share the gospel. Can we do it? Of course you can do it. Your Lord did it, and your Lord wants us to do it. Our Lord is telling us. He's commanding us, but He's also demonstrating for us. Not only should we do it, but that we need to do this. We need to let the next several days be a reflection on what our mouths and our hearts have been saying and doing recently. And I'm not even just talking about your own sin. That's always a concern. But your political thoughts, your political rhetoric, your rage against the government, your rage against one another, your rage against evil ideology. And why don't you just stop fixating on you for a moment? Turn it around and be like, why is God letting America? Why is God letting the Christian people in America go through such hardship? You're going to find an answer there. It's not one that I have for you. I'm not going to you know, give you the punchline, give you the end of the story. I'm not God. But I'm think, I, I am confident that we will find an answer if we will let God's will be the thing that leads us in the days ahead and not what the politicians or the news media or even our friends or our loved ones who are just angry. I'm not saying don't talk about it. Just don't let your heart be carried away with things you know are wrong. You murder a person, that murder's on you. You can't blame Joe Biden if you pick up a rifle and shoot someone. Even if he told you to do it, you can't blame him. You'll be responsible for that. But you know what else? And this is more important. If you'll pick up the gospel and you'll share it with those very same people and they become believers, guess who's responsible? Well, God gets the credit. But he will share reward with you because you're a fellow laborer in his field doing what he said to do. You can't save anybody, but you can take the gospel to someone who's lost. And in the midst of great suffering, that'd be the best time to say, you know what? You hurt me. You really did. But I don't want to see you burn in hell. I don't want to see God's wrath poured out on you. I'd rather see mercy and grace come into your life. And you know what? I've hurt some people in my life too. And I'd rather share the truth of the gospel with you than punch you in the face, which you deserve. Which they do deserve it. But so do we. How many punches in the face have you deserved that God has saved you from? He saved me from a lot. I was pretty mouthy. Let's pray together. I hope you'll reflect on the imagery of Christ and how we're to walk. Let's pray. Father, you are, again, you are so glorious. It's, it's amazing to reflect on your character. Uh, we pray in this moment, we pray at this time, for your character to be our character, for your truthfulness, your love, your grace, even the mercy, Father, that you show to wicked and hateful people. Help us to be those people who show mercy that way. Help us to love people enough to share the truth of Jesus with them. 
Give us the gospel on our lips and in our hearts. Help us. You've already commanded these things, but I pray, Father, that our emotional state, our principles, the core of our being follows this this line of thinking exactly the way that your son Jesus has done this. Painting a picture of grace and mercy and not, not rebellion and anger and fear and, of course, wrath. We love you. God, we pray for your help. We pray for your blessings. I pray for these people. I pray, Father, that our church would be strong and bold in these last days, in these terrible and evil times. But, Father, I pray that we would be shining lights on a hill, beacons, that we'd be salt in the earth and we'd sprinkle the truth with love all throughout the land. And, God, that people would believe because of the grace you've poured out through your son, Jesus. We give you all the glory, Father. We give you all the honor, and we pray that our worship was pleasing, and, Father, that it was holy and you would accept it this morning. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you.